Welcome friends to this second day of our three day event which will lead to the Bandara of Great Master Hazur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, my master, whose photograph you can see right here next to me. This is indeed a very important day for me because ever since he passed away in his physical body on the 2nd of April 1948, I have been celebrating this day as a day of Bandar, abundance. Bandar is just an Indian word for abundance. Bandara is the celebration of abundance. How are we celebrating the abundance on the day a person died? I explained earlier, it is not because we are celebrating the death of a person. We are celebrating that a person who we as disciples could see most of the time only in his physical form for which we had to travel long distances just to go a little glimpse of him, get a darshan of him, became visible to us 24-7 even though he was not in his physical body after 2nd April 1948. That is a very big gift that a perfect living master gives us. That when he accepts us as his friend, he remains a friend forever and not while we are in the physical bodies. He manifests himself on the day when he initiates or accepts us in us. We can see him 24-7, have a conversation with him 24-7. Ask questions and have a conversation like we have in the physical bodies. And that's a very big thing that happens. And this is one of the biggest things that can happen in the manner in which perfect living masters manifest themselves in us at the time of initiation and become our friends forever and ever means forever, for eternity. Not only is it a guarantee that they will be with us forever, their initiation is also a guarantee that they will be with us till we reach our own real home, our true home, from where we originally came into these experiences of different universes, especially this physical universe in which we are sitting now. Therefore, we are observing something very different from merely the passing away of a person. Not only that, on this day, because it was a big revelation to us, how he has not really died for us, but he's still living for us and living in a form in which we can see him and talk to him. It's a day of great abundant grace. I have watched since 1948 till 1949, till today that I have been celebrating this day, that the grace that flows on this day, on the 2nd of April is unmatched with the grace we see other days. As I said yesterday, grace is like, like rain falling. Rain falls, showers come, and they are like showers of grace. If we have a cup and we keep it straight up, it gets filled up in no time. If the cup is not kept up, only put upside down, it never gets filled up. If the cup is only sideways, few drops will get in and not too much. The cup in this case, when you want to receive grace of a perfect living master, is the cup of our attention. If our attention is all in the world, it's upside down. If our attention is partly in meditation and in the master and partly outside, it's like a cup lying sideways. Little bit of grace comes in. But if the attention is entirely inside on the master, the grace fills you up in no time. And that is why sometimes the rain is normal rain, sometimes there are extra showers. Tomorrow will be extra showers. I've seen that every year, every time. So that is why I consider this day, 2nd of April, to be a very important day of Bandara of Great Master, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh. I am very happy that you come and join me 
in this celebration. I celebrate it and invite you to come as my seva service to my master. I do not claim to be a master. I do not claim to be having anything special, except that I had a very special master, a perfect living master, Baba Savan Singh. He proved to me to the hilt that he was a perfect living master. I was a great skeptic in my young days, and he was able to remove my skepticism, not by argument, not by words, but by delivering what he promised. And I think that's the best way to know if a master is a perfect living master. If he promises something and delivers, then he is a master. So he has proven to the hilt that he is a perfect living master. I am a small disciple of his, like many disciples of his. And we all had a very good benefit from being in his presence and from the initiation he granted to us. We have, he has turned our lives completely, transformed them into something very different from what it was. I, like many of you, also went to an astrologer, drew up a chart of my life. According to the chart, it was a very different life that I led after meeting this master. Also, I would have been dead long ago, according to the chart. I'm still sitting here talking to you. So many things have changed. The chart has no value compared to what the great master decided I should be doing. The fact that I am doing this seva to him is a privilege that he has given me. Any seva is privilege. When I was very small boy and I used to see that there was no electric power in the era where great master gave his discourses and some sevadar would hold a big fan and fan him from behind. The thought came to me, I wish I could also fan the great master. So one day taking courage when somebody was fanning great master, I got up on the stage and I said, I want to fan you. And the man, Sevadar, said, get down. You're too small for this. And Great Master said, hand him the fan. And I fanned him. I can never forget it. That fanning of Great Master was Seva, no different from the Seva I'm doing today. Seva is Seva. It doesn't matter what it is. There's no different types of Seva. Seva means that you want to serve your master in any way, in any possible way, as a service, Seva. If you do Seva saying, what am I going to get out of it? It's not Seva. That's a business transaction. You are investing in something, you want something back. But if Seva is done purely out of love and devotion for a master, the value is immense. According to great master's own words, if you can do seva with love and devotion without expectation of any returns, it's equal to meditation. You'll find that the result inside will be as fast as if you have been meditating all the time. By the way, that looked like a good shortcut to me. <laughs> I followed it. So seva helped me a lot, still helping me. So that is why it's very important to understand the role of seva. What does seva do? When you are expressing your love and devotion without expecting a return, you are indeed developing and growing your love and devotion. People ask me so many emails, how can we develop love and devotion? Do seva. If you are able to do the seva directly, I could fan the master. When I couldn't fan him, he is not physically here. I'm doing seva for you. You all represent to me the great master. I see in all of you the great master when I do this seva. So that is why seva is seva no matter how it is done, where it is done, for whom it is done. If master is not there, you can serve other people. So long as you are serving with love and devotion, without expecting a return, take it, it's as good as meditation. And you'll see the results of it when you actually meditate and you find, why am I making progress? I did not do that much meditation. Yesterday, 
where is my pro paper gone i did not read the paper i read it too late it said that 11 to 12 i'll be talking to you and 12 to 1 will be meditation i thought you are going to meditate but nobody meditated did you expect me to meditate i am doing seva good good enough in any case i meditated enough earlier so i am only mentioning the importance of seva and it's a very important thing and it serves a lot much more than we realize but keep seva as an expression of your devotion of your love and devotion and then it works today i want to tell you something which many people have asked me in their emails and i want to touch upon it and that is what is this law of karma it comes up again and again a friend came to me and he said i don't believe in karma at all i said what do you believe in he said i believe it's a natural state in which we are born which we die we live a life where is karma to play any any role i said have you ever had an accident yes did you have any idea where you would be born no do you meet people you say look like i've met them before yes of course that happens sometimes how do you account for these things he says that's a random law it's a law of randomness i said if i tell you that even the law of randomness is the same as the law of karma will you accept it the law of randomness is what is helping you to understand the law of living and let me explain to you the law of karma is also equally random who decided what karma we'll have we were living in our home true home where there is no karma we are in reality pure souls pure units of consciousness pure life with nothing on it that's our reality no karma at all karma is only carried on an equipment we are wearing we are using to have an experience of time and space karma is merely on a machine not on us we have no karma at all and can i tell you that if you look at it overall the karma we picked out on that particular machine was random it could have been any karma so therefore i could explain to you based on the principles of randomness that the karma is consistent with the law of randomness which they examining what is the law of randomness is not as random as they think there is some some pattern going on even randomness for example you have a coin it has heads and tails if you toss it and the coin is equally balanced the chances of its coming heads and tails are equal you try it how many times does it come heads how many times it comes tails nobody can predict it's random totally random you throw a coin and out of 10 times nine times can be heads one time can be tails it can be eight times head two time tails any number can come if you it, it is generally not in 10 throws generally it won't be 10 heads and zero tails if you throw it 100 times it will not be 10 or 90 it will go closer to 40 60 something there if you throw it a million times it will be 50 50 how is it random operating is it totally random it can come any way what law is governing that over time in a larger number of cases it follows a certain rule non random rule therefore there is something about randomness and the same thing which the rule applies when it is very large it no longer random it's very small it looks random same thing is about karma that karma as a pattern is very large huge it is infinite combinations permutations combinations in which life can be created no end to it 
You can keep on inventing more and more. But when you invent infinite number of them and decide to pick which one to pick up, it looks random but becomes orderly and becomes part of a system. Now, law of karma is not easy to understand. I remember I used to hear stories about Lord Krishna. They used to talk about Lord Krishna, the avatar of Vishnu and his teachings because he seemed to know a lot when he was a child. And then a story came up that when he was, when he was a little child, he used to go out with his friend named Udo. Both of them were taking care of cows of the village. They were cow herds. They both went out to take care of the cows and nearby pastures. And they would talk to each other, spend time. And one day, Krishna tells Udo, Udo, the law of karma is very strange. It's not easy to understand. And then an ant was crawling there, and he points out, he says, Udo, look at this ant. It's a little insect. Once it has been Brahma, the creator of this universe. Once it has been Indra, the head of one of the heavens in the astral plane. Because of his karma, he became Brahma. Because of his karma, he became Indra. Because of his karma, he became an insect after that. There is no atonement in this law of karma. How is it created? How do we account for karma being created while we are living here in this physical world when we say everything that is happening here is because of the law of karma? It's happening because we have defined through our mind, not our soul, not ourselves, through a machine we are using, the thinking mind, through thinking mind, and being born in an environment, in an experience of people, societies, who have taught us moral values, that we have decided this action is good, this action is bad. We have determined and stored the good and bad in our minds. And when we do something good, we feel happy and we are entitled to a reward. When we do something evil or bad, we are entitled to punishment and we punish ourselves or get punished. Simple law of punishment and reward based upon what you think is right or wrong. And it is happening all over. When we came first time, we had no karma. The soul has no karma at all. How did we get karma to begin with? When we came first time, we had a choice to pick up any destiny. It was an adventure. An adventure into a dreamland. An adventure into a fantasy we could create. The power of consciousness of the soul was so strong Whatever it became conscious of became creation. So its consciousness was working two ways. It became conscious, created, and then it became conscious and experienced what it created, both simultaneously. This is the great power of consciousness. When consciousness came to power, it created a means of expanding its experience into time and space and generated an equipment called the human mind and took on the equipment and found that in order to experience space and time, you create events to experience. Time was created first, timeline. All of time was created in one go. It was not created in pieces. Time was created in one piece at once. We decided to put events on them, all kinds of events. And the way we put the events on them was a pattern that would lead to the law of karma. We connected the events together for an easy flow of events on timeline. And those events became cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. 
So we could explain every event with the prior event that became its cause. Beautiful way. Just experiment. The experiment of consciousness to design something for a new experience, for a new experiment. And as consciousness developed as cause and effect, it tried to say, we should have people experiencing that. So we decided to create puppets, little puppets, and all the puppets were placed there. And the puppets would move on the timeline. And then we said, we are seeing a puppet show. It's too far away on the screen. We want to be close to the action. Decided to pick up one of the puppets and sit in the head of that puppet and see the show very closely. And we became that actor, that puppet, and became alive. All the other puppets looked alive also because we were also puppets of the same type. But we were alive, conscious. We were the same soul, same soul in one puppet, in the head of one of them. And that became our life. And we created birth and death as a cause and an effect. And we created many events in between based upon what the mind was trained to do, good and bad. That's how life was created. The law of karma, we picked up, the soul picked up for experimentation. Any one puppet. It does not mean that the, that particular puppet was special or something. Anyone. Because all puppets became alive when you became a puppet. So that is why it's a great show that it's a big act going on. All of us are actors. We just chose to sit close to the action by sitting in the head, third eye center of one of the actors. Did it matter which one we picked up? Not at all. All the puppets were your creation. Everything was the creation of the same consciousness. It hardly mattered where you sat. It hardly mattered what kind of experience you had. You had a lot of roller collar experiences. You said, wonderful. Now, next time I sit in somewhere else. This kind of thing was the origin of our law of karma here that we picked it up. In a very simpler way, I can say that when the soul decided to create time and space through the mind, and the mind was merely an instrument for creating time and space in which it fed life through thinking. Thinking was the life of the mind. And thinking was introduced in this machine, which we began to adopt almost like a dress upon ourselves. We covered ourselves with the mind and began to operate through the mind. It was wonderful that we picked up any role. I sometimes refer to the story of Geoffrey Chaucer, the English author, who wrote the Canterbury Tales. In that story, there's a very important story in English literature because they say that is the foundation of modern novel. Modern novel is, is considered to be great because it gives characters. To the actors, it makes them characters. Before Chaucer, there were once upon a time a king and a king and married a queen and they, they died. Now after Chaucer, it was a there was a treacherous king. He was a generous king. A character was added. Because Chaucer was the first to add character to his actors who were in the book, in the story. The story is about 40 or 50 pilgrims traveling to Canterbury for a pilgrimage. And as they traveled, there were no modern means of travel. Most of them were walking on foot, some on horseback, some on a carriage. And to while away the time, they were telling stories to each other and they were singing songs to each other, telling poems. Now Chaucer is the author of this story. He says, I was also there. So Chaucer was also there amongst them. So amongst all the actors in the story, Chaucer becomes one actor. In the middle of this book, the other actors say, Chaucer, you are a great poet because he's written the whole book. You are a great storyteller. Tell us some. Give us some good poem. Chaucer says, I don't know any poetry. 
the man who's written the whole book, when he becomes a character, doesn't know anything. They say, no, no, we know you are a good poet. Come on with some of your good poems. And Chaucer comes up with the worst doggerel rhyme in the whole book. All the characters recognize it so bad, they criticize him. Oh, we expected something better from you. Sometimes this very story that Chaucer, the author, could have picked up any role he liked. Why did he pick up a role where he was to be criticized by his own creation? He created all the characters. He could have picked up the best character. He picked up one who was criticized by his own creation. He's compared to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was one with his father, the creator of the universe. And yet he was crucified by his own creation. Why? How could Jesus Christ, if he was one with the father, the creator of everything, creator of the people who crucified him, why did he get crucified? The answer in both cases is the same. Whether you talk of Jesus Christ or you talk of Geoffrey Chaucer, the answer is Jesus Christ was all as father. Chaucer was all the characters as author. But as an actor, he took one role. Did it make a difference to him which role he took? Not at all. Because he was all characters. He wrote all of them. And he was aware of it, that he was all of them. And that is why when we pick up a role, we don't worry which character we are picking up. We pick up the character that will make the story most dramatic and place ourselves where we can watch the drama the best we can. It's a drama. This life is a drama. We picked up this thing. Another way of explaining is that when we came to the causal plane of the mind and space and time was created and we could travel on time and have events one after the other, we decided to pick up a DVD which we can play. And there was millions of DVDs, trillions of DVDs, infinite number of DVDs we could pick up, which were all combinations of destinies of human life. And we decided to try one. And we picked up one and are playing it, and that's our life. It's just playing. It's the play of our DVD picked up from a another level of consciousness. Not very far away, causal consciousness, mental consciousness. That's where we picked up our DVD, and we are playing it here. Some, have, some people who have heard me say that said, couldn't we pick up a better DVD? Is this the best we could do? I said, first of all, it didn't matter from that point of view which one you picked up. Just like it didn't matter for Chaucer which character to pick up. Secondly, you were very wise in what you picked up. You decided to have a lot of roller coaster events. One life, two life, five life, whatever you decided. Because how multiple lives come and you come only for one life is also a very good, interesting point. You picked up one life, one DVD. How did past lives come into being? There were no past lives. But you cannot, under the law of creation of these events here, have any event without a cause. Therefore, when you place yourself on the timeline, it had to be related to the past events that created this life. All of them are connected by cause and effect. So without having lived a past life, you were born here and had a past life. Never lived it. It's a notional past life. Notional past life to justify every event that is happening here. That is how the law of karma operates. That you have to have a cause for every effect here. It cannot happen without it. So therefore our whole life is governed by past life. Past life has to live on another past life and so on. Infinite past lives are created when we come for one life. Infinite future lives are created. One life puts us into a cycle of lives that we live. Whether we have lived them or not, doesn't matter. We haven't lived past lives, we haven't lived future lives, but they are all there when we are in one life, all connected with what is good, what is bad. And this is good, I deserve to be rewarded, and you are rewarded. This is bad, I need to be punished, you are punished. Either by yourself, the same life, or next life, or next life, or hundredth life. Doesn't matter when. It's a single line of time. When I mention single line of time, sometimes people say the Egyptians were able to time travel. I said, what a big deal. We are all doing it. 
we are all traveling on time right now. Every minute that passes is traveling on time. Time is not moving. We are moving from event to event. What else is there? Only difference was that we move at a fixed rate on timeline. And those people, the Egyptians or some others, were able to advance a little faster or slower. That's not a big deal. We'll be able to do it also. Science is going in that direction today for time travel based on that same principle. That we are, all the events are already there. Science first time accepted it. That past, present and future exist simultaneously is a statement by scientists today. Therefore, the events are already there. We just move in time to those events. Just because we don't know them, it looks like we are deciding where to go. But the events, we are automatic. Our thinking process is designed to go with them. It's, it's uh, designed like that. It's, it, is, it is not only we are pre programmed like that. To go only thinking to make decisions according to that timeline. So what is, let me tell it in a different way. A very different way about time. We are all living in a time called now. Anybody who is not living in now, please let, let me know. No. no, no hands are raised. I'm happy to hear, confirm it. We are living in a now. How much time is there in now? Zero time. When I say now, it's past. Before I said it, it was future. Now has zero time. Are we living in zero time? Of course not. I know how much time I've spoken to you. I know how many minutes have passed. We all know how much time is going on. How can this experience take place in zero time? If it is totally zero, now is totally zero time. It's happening because we are considering the immediate past as now. What just happening few seconds, few minutes ago, we are calling it now. So immediate past is being called now by mistake. Because we don't know. We can't say a word even in now. We can't speak. We can't think. We can't do nothing. Zero. Human being is incapable of doing anything in now. And when somebody sent me a book which said live in the now, I was shocked. Where are we living? I want to meet somebody who's not living in the now. What The book also meant the same thing. Live in the immediate past and not too far behind. Don't go back into memories and so on. Live in what is very recent to you. Then maybe past is there. And maybe events from future are coming to make our past through a now, which we are sitting on. Let us say, supposing we stopped three things. We stop hoping. We stop fearing. We stop anticipating the same three things. When you hope it's a positive anticipation, fear is negative anticipation, anticipation neutral. Supposing we stop doing these things, do you realize there will be no future at all? Future is being created by us continuously. And I examine, this is something very interesting. We think there is a future. How do we think? Because we hope. Fear, anticipate, this may happen, that will happen, I know this will happen, I know I'll get up from here and go there. It's all because of our mental thinking that we say there is a future. And to do these things, fearing, hoping, anticipating, needs time and is in the past. Examine carefully, future is all in the past. Nothing is in the future, nothing in the present, all past. Now, the interesting thing about past is that nobody can ever go back into the past because it's over, it's gone. But you can remember it. You can remember it, remember it very vividly. This, what we call the present, is a very viv vivid recollection of the past. That's all. Very vivid, very clear recollection going on in consciousness, in front of us, through the five senses of the, of the past. Now, you can't recall the past if it wasn't there at all. Where does it come from? But if you are playing a DVD, the whole DVD has the past, present, and future in it at one time. 
when you play it it creates the past the present and the future therefore when we say that we have a past it's a set of memories nothing more than that we are having a very vivid lucid recovery and play of our memories that's what our life is i'm making a point which is not easy but try to understand how that there is no time in now how we are experiencing life is because we are recalling vividly lucidly as an actual experience the past memories when did the memories take place if you are living in now here all the time there is no time for a memory to be recorded memories were recorded much earlier in the causal plane and that's where the dvds were prepared there were destinies were prepared destinies are nothing more than a group of memories put together and we are now going through those memories which we picked up they have tried psychologists have tried out to put a capsule of memories in patients and the patient think they actually lived that some hypnotists have tried to hypnotize people and say you were so and so and you actually believe i remember all that the memory comes back we are living exactly the same way now i'm just explaining to you the nature of time and the nature of space is very similar space but the extension of time that is why when we like to understand the law of karma the law of karma is merely a play of a capsule of a dvd we have picked up of memories and once we picked up that then we made it a reality how can we make a play reality one factor was very simple by entering into the head of one character that made it very real and the second more more important thing was that we began to judge the reality of our experience not from checking with where we came from not checking from where this was created not checking where the dvd came from not where the memories came from checking from within this experience through sense perceptions we divided perception which we had the mind has a perception the mind can perceive anything we divided the perception of the mind into separate perceptions seeing was different hearing was different touching was different smelling was different tasting was different by separating the five we now have means to create reality by saying i can see this table is it real yes i touch it real by matching one sense perception with another we say this is real so the, these two factors created reality for us so what was a drama what was a illusion what was just a created show what was a dream became real because we put the definition of reality to be checked by what is happening within the dream now supposing we actually have a dream at night supposing in the dream i am still seeing a table which i can we, we see the same things in dreams and i still see a dream and i say is it a dream or is the table real i touch it it's real it will remain real while i'm dreaming when i wake up there was no table the table was created by the dream when do i find out only when i wake up not during the dream we have sometimes had i have sometimes had a dream where i knew it was a dream what did i do i called everybody it's a dream i'm telling you it's a dream when i woke up there was nobody to tell it was just part of the dream that i could even tell what it was i did not make a difference this is the beauty of this creation this is the most wonderful part that you could create some by something by illusion in consciousness and make it real by applying certain rules applying certain rule to the creation itself by which the judgment of reality comes from judging within itself and not from outside not by waking up but as it happens fortunately we can also wake up that's a very good fortune for us that we have a capability placed in us in one form of life in which we live here because consciousness is appearing all over us all around us there are two types of consciousness active and passive what the difference between the two i want to touch this table is my decision i am using my will my conscious will to touch the table 
the table cannot touch me. My awareness of my will to touch the table is active. The table is passive. Both are part of consciousness. The, what I am experiencing through my will and able to have experience is active consciousness. What I am experiencing is different kind of consciousness because it's part of my consciousness but has no activity of its own. So that is why the consciousness creates in that form, active and passive, and everything is created on the same principle. So that is why when we find out that we are operating here under a law which we have introduced for this region, and we have other laws too, for a more wakeful state, just like we have a laws in the dream state. At least we know our dream states more than we know our more higher wakeful state. Because very few people have a wakeful state. But most, most of us, all of us have a dream state. So let's look at the dream state. In the dream state, the laws are different. For example, look at the nature of time in a dream. You can be here in Menominee in one second, in Chicago, the next second looks normal. Nobody has ever questioned a dream how suddenly it came somewhere else. It looks natural. Suddenly scene changes to something completely different. We take it as normal. The time factor is very different in a dream. You can dream a long time and be awake for that period for a short time. In the 60s, 1960s, I came to the United States first time. It was a very popular subject. Dream and sleep was a very popular subject. There were a lot of sleep clinics also going on. I joined one of them just to understand what they know about dreams and maybe they might know something about higher wakefulness and know that this is also a dream. Maybe they have a better idea. But no, they were only experimenting with dreams from the below the physical level. So physical subjects were asked to sleep and they put some cameras to see the rapid eye movement of the eye. They put some electrodes and so on to see what happened to the vital signs during dreams. How hard how in a certain dream the heart will beat faster, the pulse rate will go up, and so on. Those experiments were being done. So I studied them for almost a week. And in one experiment, one subject, eyes were fluttering. We could see his dreaming. When eyes were not fluttering, we would wake up, no dream. When eyes are fluttering, there's a dream. Which way? It can flutter up and down, or flutter sideways, or angles. Then we discovered why the eyelids flutter in a particular way of the physical body. Dream is taking place with the person not even knowing there is a body. And the body is reacting to it, the eyes particularly, as if something is happening behind the eyes somewhere. So when the rapid eye movement, REM they call it now, rapid eye movement was upside down. We woke up the patient, the subject. What were you dreaming? Oh, I was seeing a waterfall. This waterfall comes up and down. The inner eye, the dreaming eye, was also seeing up and down. And this eye was moving in the same direction. Another person we woke up whose eye was moving horizontally. What were you seeing? I was seeing a tennis match. So because tennis match was like this, his eye, inner eye was moving like this. So was the rapid eye movement like that. In one subject, there was very rapid eye movement going on in many directions. So we thought this will be a very important subject to study. So we allowed the dream to go on for more than seven minutes. And no dream lasted more than 12 minutes, by the way. Normal time for a dream was a few minutes, sometimes seven minutes to 12 minutes were the most well-remembered dreams. People could wake up in the middle and be told, what is your dream? They'll tell you exactly what they're dreaming. When they woke up in the morning, they could not remember any dream. So most of us don't remember any dream. We dream several times, all of us. That study showed. We all dream at night. So when that person was awakened after seven minutes, he said, what were you dreaming? Oh, I dreamt I was a little child going to school. I remember going to school every day. I was walking up and down. I'd say my classmates were there. Then I found a girl I liked very much. She was my sweetheart. I married her. And then we grew up. We had children. And then the children grew up. And then I found that I was getting old. I became very old. The children were got married. And they had their children. And when I was very old. You woke me up. He lived his whole life in seven minutes. 
In the dream, he actually felt this was his own life. In physical time, it was seven minutes. So I'm just telling you that the nature of time, the experience of time is totally different in the dream state, totally different in the wakeful state, totally different in the astral state, and absolutely different in the causal state of consciousness or wakefulness. And yet, what a wonderful thing that we as human beings have the capacity to wake ourselves up, even from this dream. Let me take another example. Supposing a man is sleeping and you are awake. Your friend is sleeping. And your friend, you want to wake up the friend. He's having a dream. He's having a dream that he's taking his horses home. He's holding his two horses and carrying them home. And you give him a nudge. Wake up, wake up. He says, but who will take my horses? He's still in the dream state. He's speaking up in the physical state, but his eyes and his vision is on the horses. He says, who will take care of my horses? And you say, don't worry, wake up, I'll take care of your horses. And he wakes up. Does he say, where are my horses? Does he blame you for telling a lie that you will take care of your horses? No, you participated in his dream to wake him up. Can you imagine what wakes us up to a higher level? Somebody nudging us who is awake. And we say, who will take care of our horses? He says, I will. Man like him. A perfect living master nudges us and we awake. How does he nudge us? How does he give us a feeling in this state that we are being nudged by that unusual pull of love? That love that pulls us from the soul, not from the mind, not the thinking part, but something inside us. We feel like going and seeing him again and again. We want to just go and see, just be there, even if we don't say anything. We just want to be there. What is this pull? Where is it coming from? It's a nudge taking place somewhere else, not here. Here we think it's a pull. Elsewhere it's a nudge to wake up. And this pull of love is the, is the real secret that wakes us up. Does meditation wake us up or the nudge wakes us up? No, meditation is a means, not an end. Meditation is a means to validate that there is something more than here. That's all. Meditation does not take us to our true home. No meditation has ever taken anybody to his true home. And I have been meditating with so many masters and so many yogis and swamis. And I can tell you, no meditation ever took anybody to his true home. Because all meditation was with the mind and with the effort of the mind. And it is only effortless love that takes you beyond. Only love can take you beyond your mind. The mind stops with effort. And there is no effort. Of course... People don't understand that everything we do, I am going to meditate. There's a block. You won't go beyond your own effort. I meditate regularly so many hours. Okay. There's a block. You place the block on yourself by trying to meditate so many hours. It's your mind working. Nobody by effort can go there. A friend of mine, when I was at the university, he wrote to me. I have learned that the true way to go home is effortless. Beautiful letter he wrote to me. At the end he wrote, now I'm going to make every effort to do effortless pro. <laughs> That's the mind. The mind can't get over it. The mind thinks we have to do something to get something. We're trained like that. Our mind is trained, indoctrinated like that. That we have to do something to get something. Therefore, we create a barrier upon our own journey to our true home. But when love comes, it's not connected to the mind. Love is not pulling the mind. Love is pulling our soul. Mind is sometimes resisting at the very time when the mind, soul is being pulled. Mind is doubting, sometimes fearing, sometimes afraid, and the pull is still there. And that pull is for the soul. And that soul is pulled by love. Now, when you want to go beyond the mind, the pull must come from somewhere beyond the mind also. Even in meditation, you can reach two levels above this wakeful state through meditation, through effort. You can withdraw your attention 
from this physical world, from the physical body, by concentrating your attention with effort behind the eyes at the third eye center. You can reach there. You can stabilize yourself there with long meditation and even enter the astral plane, the overlap of the astral plane, which is combined with this physical experience and an astral experience, and even go higher. In very rare cases, you can, with properly guidance, proper guidance and your effort, reach even the causal plane. But that's the end, because that's all the region of the mind. All these three are regions of the mind. The physical, the astral, causal, or the physical, or the sensory systems, or the mental systems are all part of the mind. To go beyond, no effort is possible. But if you have to be pulled by love beyond these, the love must come from beyond these. It's very important. If we are pulled by love here, it's very nice. We like to go see the person who we love. We like to see the person who is loving us. It's great. But to go in the higher realm, in the higher region, in the higher level of consciousness, the pull must come from higher. And that is why that pull that is higher than the mind only comes from those who are themselves operating from higher than the mind, even in physical form. And that is a definition of a perfect living master. Whose picture you see here, his pull came from beyond the mind. When you went in, you were pulled at every stage, not only here. Every stage, not only you saw the image. These are images. You saw the physical form here, you saw an astral form, your form was astral, master's form is astral, causal form, you are in a causal form with no real sense perceptions, so is the master. That's a form. But what is pulling you is from beyond the mind. And a perfect living master operates from beyond the mind at all times, 24-7, whether he is currently in the physical form astral form or causal form. A master who says, one day I had a great journey, great experience, I am going to share with you, is not a perfect living master. A master who had great experiences in the past and just telling us his experiences is not a master, perfect living master. A perfect living master has reached that point of oneness, of unity, that point of single consciousness, totality of consciousness, from where all things are happening within itself. And therefore, when he's in a physical form, he's also in all other forms at the same time. We also can be in the, in the same state. But when we make progress in the inward journey, we make progress stage by stage. When we withdraw attention from the physical body to get an experience of the inner body, we have to let go of the physical experience, become unaware of it to get the other experience. When we want to get a causal experience, we have to let go of the astral experience and the physical experience to have that experience. At one time, we only experience one reality, one level of consciousness. The reality is created by that experience within itself. So this is a level of realities we go through. But when you reach the top, all realities and all illusions are the same and you find the creative power is the one to which you belong and that's your true home. Perfect living masters operate from their true home. And that means that even when they're in physical body here, when they talk to us, they don't talk from what they've read or what the books say or what they've experienced earlier. They are talking about what they're experiencing at the moment when they're talking to us. That's a big thing. So that means any pull we experience here is also pull being generated inside us at the astral plane, also at causal plane, and also from beyond. And that is where love and devotion makes us go even beyond the mind. So that is why to go beyond the mind, you need a perfect living master who has gone beyond the mind. Anybody who has gone beyond the mind, I would say, is a perfect living master. Of course, there are two levels of perfect living masters also. Those who have gone beyond the mind, beyond this physical, astral, causal creations and found out we are souls, immortal souls, units of consciousness. They are also sad gurus. They are perfect masters and they have found out the reality of our own self. They found out the self is a soul. 
And then there are Satgurus who have gone even beyond and found that the soul is also a cover. Individuation of a soul is merely a cover like other covers, and the totality is only one. And they are perfect living masters also. But they are the highest perfect living masters. I am so happy that I found in Baba Savan Singh, whose bandara I am coming to celebrate with you, a perfect living master of the highest order. Call him Sat Purush. Call him the ultimate truth. What is the ultimate truth of us? Our ultimate truth is our own ultimate self. Where is it all coming from? It's all coming from the same source, which is our true home. Imagine the beauty of this experience that we can sit as six places away from our true home, sitting with covers upon ourselves just to have new experiences. Like they now wear some glasses and wear some other things on their hands to have what they call virtual experience. We are having a virtual experience without the glasses. <laughs> we having, it's all a virtual experience. Every level is a virtual experience. We'll discover how we created these virtual experiences and made them real. The beauty of it is that we could make it real by locking out other experiences. It's not that we generated a special reality. Just by making the definition of reality something we can check with our sense perceptions and locking out all other awarenesses while we have one experience, we made it a reality. It's good we made it a reality. We didn't come just for seeing a shadow. We came to see real things. Our intention, consciousness didn't want to just have wasted time seeing shadows on the screen, wanted to see something more real. And what a beautiful reality we created. Look how real we are. Look how real we talk to each other and take everything to be real. We take meditation to be real. We take masters to be real. We take spiritual path to be real. We take the worldly obligations to be real. We take death to be real. We take birth to be real. What is reality we have created? Everything has become real for us. Just by simple technique of locking out other levels of awareness, which can be reached. Now, what good thing has happened for which I can congratulate all of you? Very good thing has happened. Like, congratulations. And that is for we are all human beings. Not a big deal. There are a lot of human beings outside also. Why I congratulate you as human beings? Because human beings happen to be the only form of life in which you are blocked from all knowledge of the future. And therefore, you feel you have free will. This experience of free will generated by blocking information from you is so sweet that you actually feel you make your destiny every day. You actually feel that you make your decisions every day. Can't help it. We have no idea what is stored in our subconscious in the head. We have no idea how much past is existing in our DNA molecules sitting inside. We are unaware totally unaware. We are aware of, as a physical being, we are sitting here and deciding whether to go out and have lunch or not, whether to eat this or not, whether to meet so and so or not. All decisions we are making ourselves. Nobody else is making for us. We look around. No, we can't let anybody else make decisions. We make our own decisions. Free will. We have free will. We have a real experience of free will created by ignorance of reality. It's wonderful. Now, what is the benefit of having a real experience, which is no reality, but real experience? The benefit is, while we have the experience, we also can have experience of seeking to wake up, of seeking to go to higher levels. Seeking is also part of free will. If there was no free will, we could never seek. And that is why seeking comes as an option to us. No other form of life is the option to seek. Neither plants, nor animals, nor angels, nor gods. How come the angels and gods are also excluded? Because they know the future. They have no power of seeking. We don't know the future. We have power of seeking. Only one form, according to the ancient scriptures are 8.4 million forms, Jurassic Lock, 8.4 million forms of 
life existing in this universe. And out of them, one form only has an experience by which you can seek. And the answer to the question, how will you find the truth? The answer is one word, seek. Seek and you will find. Period. Nothing more is needed. Seeking inside will give you the answer. Meditation is merely a step in seeking. Love is merely a form of seeking. Devotion is a form of seeking. We are seeking something. We are all seeking something. But we think that we can seek outside in the experience we are generating outside. Because what can be inside a little body of ours? We can't imagine anything in this physical body. It must be everything is all outside. We seek outside. We go to temples. We go to mosques. We go to churches. We go to synagogues. We go to other places of worship. We go to bandaras. We go everywhere to seek outside. We go to masters. Everything outside. But the seeking has to be inside. Everybody else says, come, I'll give you something. A perfect master says, no, go inside and you find it. Big difference. There was a Swami, Swami Vivekananda. More than 120 years ago, he came to the United States. And he was sitting outside the house of an old lady. Didn't know. She recognized he could speak good English and brought him to the World Congress of Religion that was going on at that time in Chicago and made him speak. He was a good speaker. He turned out to be speaking of the nature of this universe. He said, this universe is illusion. It's not real. Find real universes inside you. And next day, he again spoke. And he said, I have been calling this universe illusion. That means I am also illusion. How come I am telling you something, I am illusion, you are illusion and talking of illusion. What's the difference between me and you? The difference is you are living in the illusion to find reality in the illusion. And I have come to tell you, I am also illusion, but this illusion is telling you, find the reality inside you. That's the difference. It's a big statement he made. Perfect living master, do not say you'll find something by going to the rivers and the mountains and to meditate here or there. They say, go within yourself. They say, there is only one real temple in which you can worship the truth. And that's your own body. Not only the body, your own head. Some mystics have said that this portion from the eyes to the top, this dome, is the real church, real, real temple, real mosque, real place to go to for worship. No other place can give you what this can give. Therefore, go inside here. Worship here. Pray here. Sing here. Dance here. Do what you like here, not outside, if you want the truth. So seeking inside, just these two steps. Seeking inside with something that is not mental will take you to your true home. Seeking inside with love and devotion. And if you have, if you're lucky that somebody is giving you a nudge from another wakeful state, you will wake up with that nudge. And you will feel that love, that experience in the dream state is the one that wakes you up in the wakeful state. I'm very happy to share all these thoughts with you. And karma is not as simple as we think. It's the basis of our creation here. It's all predetermined, all fixed forever for everybody. And we just pick up some small sections of it and we come here and play it out. There is no atonement in karma. You do good things, you'll be rewarded. You do bad things, you'll be punished. In this life, next life, or a hundredth life. In one of our great epics, which is considered to be a spiritual book, they describe it. A blind king. And the blind king, through meditation, is able to see his past lives. 
and he goes on seeing his past lives, how could I become blind? And he sees 100 past lives. He did nothing to become blind. Therefore, he asked Krishna, who's also in that epic, that Krishna, you can, you can tell us about past lives. I have seen 100 past lives. I did nothing to become blind. Krishna says, go a little further. 104th previous life. You were doing something. You took out the eyes of a person. And that punishment has come after 104 lives taken place. And he says, but where were the, where were the karma lying all this while? He says, there are three types of karma. A pralabd or destiny is only meant for this one life. We are born with a destiny for this life. Where do we pick it up from? Past life, past lives. Could be 104 lives. Pieces have been picked up there to make one life here. Then we get so many fixed items in this life. Where we'll be born, where we will die, who we will meet accidentally, where we'll have accidents to our body, where we'll fall sick, where we'll get treatment. All prefixed already. In between the little, little gaps, not too many, but 20% of the total time, we have gaps where we make decisions. And we decide. When you decide, every time you decide something, there is element of good or bad. When element of good or bad comes, karma is created. And there's this next type of karma. Kar karma and karma, you're creating now. Pralab, destiny you brought. Karma, you're creating now. And what cannot be accommodated with all the karma you create goes into a reservoir is your own mind. And that reservoir is called sentient karma. And the same mind comes again and again. With the same mind we are born again and again. And that whole karma is carried in the mind and creates new lives. So explained very nicely that this is not only one life that come, creates karma. If somebody is doing good karma, I want to be a good person. I want to do good karma. Don't want to do anything bad. I'm from a very religious family. I've decided to live a very pious, good life. And he leads all good life. He goes to heaven. Spends time there. Till the past again comes up. And pushes him back into another incarnation. Because karma has not gone away. The sinchit karma, the reserve karma is so much. That we have to carry it with us. And no matter how hard we try. We do bad, evil things. So bad, we deserve hell. And there is a hell in the astral plane where you can be sent to spend time. And then you say, oh, I did something very bad. I am going to be very pious now, do very good things to overcome that hell. I don't want to go to hell. I am doing good things. Supposing the bad things entitle you to go to one month in hell, you will go to hell. If the good things want you to go to heaven for one month, you will go to heaven. So it is the only choice which you get when we die. When we die, what happens? When we die, suddenly we see our whole life backwards. Very fast, we see our life backwards. And then we are pulled out of the body. As this is, this is going on, we are no longer in the body. Being pulled out from the extremities back to the brain. And we are off. But we are alive in the disembodied state. In that state, they say that there is an angel of death or another soul responsible for determining our next life. And the next life, one question is asked. Oh, you have a month in heaven and a month in hell. Where do you want to go first? Your answer counts a lot at that time. Now, I want to put the general question, theoretical question to you. If you were asked that you have one month in heaven, one month in hell, how many of you would go to heaven first? How many of you go to hell first? So many people ready for hell. <laughs> A simple question. Nobody would be ready for hell, but everybody is ready for hell first. It only the point I'm making is there's no real atonement in the law of karma. And that is why we try to atone and we it's a trap. The biggest trap. We talk of prison. I got a letter yesterday from a man rotting in prison asking for some help. And I was saying, look at the prison we are all in. The prison of karma, of this life. It's a very big prison. Can't get out. There's no way I can think of getting out. 
it's just a chance that we can meet a perfect living master and get a nudge or something and get love that takes us beyond this law of karma. And law of karma not only operates here, it operates in dreams. It operates at the astral level. It operates at the causal level. Karma, law of karma is so strong. It's a very big prison. The biggest prison. We can't think of a bigger prison. I have no definition of a bigger prison than the prison of the law of karma that we are trapped in here. We are lucky that by seeking, we are able to find perfectly masters. Sometimes we can meet many masters because our seeking is not very clear. Many of us don't even know what we are seeking. There's something in us saying, look, something is missing. Something missing, but you don't know what it is. You're still seeking, but you don't know what it is. Gradually it comes up. It's not this world. It's not over here. I've tried out this world, especially as you grow older, you find it is not this world that is giving you anything. And you have so many disappointments in this world. So much expectation. So many disappointments. And therefore we say it is not coming from here. There's something else. And then you become a little more spiritual oriented and want to find what the spirit is. Who am I? Where am I? I am not here. This is temporary. And who am I? And then you begin to go. The seeking goes. Become a little more clear. The seeking becomes more and more clear as we begin to investigate. Do we belong somewhere that is not here? So seeking, when the seeking is to go to heaven, most religions tell us go to heaven. The destination of most religions is heaven, which is in the astral plane. And we say we seek heaven. So we meet a master who takes us to heaven. And when the term is over, Master is back and we are back. So therefore, it's not a real solution. It's a temporary band-aid. So, but if we seek more, we can go to causal plane, which is very rare. Very few masters take us there. It's only very rare when we have gone through masters, several masters, and we say, this is not what we want. We are not satisfied. We want more. That then a perfectly master appears in our life. We don't find him. He appears in our life. Because we are ready to go beyond the mind. When we discover the limitation of our own mind, when we discover that the mind itself is holding us back, then we are ready to go beyond. And at that time, perfect living master appears in our life and we are pulled slowly and gradually we discover who he is. We think he's just an ordinary man. You see, ordinary man living like that, uh, maybe a white bearded man, old man. Look, beard is looking nice, of course. I liked his beard. He's just a man. Just a man telling th stories. And some are interesting stories, some are not. But they're all stories. Making good stories. And I noticed that these masters cannot describe the truth. They cannot describe what is beyond the mind. Because the mind cannot assimilate, nor has the mind developed any language to describe what is existing beyond it. For example, I'll give you one simple example. If I say, can you imagine a large mansion, beautiful mansion up in the sky? I think all of you can imagine, right? Now tell me, how many of you can imagine a large mansion, beautiful, huge mansion in zero time and zero space? Nobody. And yet it exists. So therefore, the limitation to what the mind can describe or the language that we have developed to describe things. So masters have to tell stories, stories that fit our experience here. That is why all these stories of higher levels are all translated into language of our physical experiences here. Seth Shivdyal Singh, Swamiji of Agra, from where the Radha Swami movement started, he used to tell stories in the higher, highest region. They're tall trees, several miles tall, all laden with diamonds and rubies and jewelry. Most of his audience were women, by the way. <laughs> you can understand the story. When there's no space and time, where are the trees growing from? That is why it's very difficult. It's impossible to describe things that are there. Some yogis have said, when we have that experience, the only way to describe is Neti, neti, 
not this, not this, not this. There is none of this. But we can't say what it is. So that's why it's very difficult for explaining. And that's why masters have always used stories to tell. Beautiful stories. And they tell us nice stories, but the stories hint at what is possible there. And that is why I've told you all stories. I'm telling you stories every day. And I know they are stories, but they carry some meaning beyond the story. It's like a parable. It's like a, like a story which is a lesson in the hid, hidden in the words. So I'm very happy to share this information with you about the law of karma today. And tomorrow will be the Bandara, great master. I will come back and see you. At, I have another meeting to attend. Then I have a lunch engagement. But you also enjoy your lunch, longer lunch. And I'll see you at 3 o'clock again. And then we'll uh, meet tomorrow again. So thank you very much for your presence and for encouraging me in my celebration of the Bandara of Great Master. Will you answer a few questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. Please wait, wait. <laughs> Don't be in a hurry. I forgot. We have to meditate. <laughs> no, not yet. I have to answer a few questions. Okay. Jonathan will read out some questions. I'll answer them before we go. Please tell us if by withdrawing our attention to the third eye, we are actually meditating on our true self. Please tell us if by withdrawing our attention to the third eye, we are actually meditating on our true self. Yes, we are. The true self is hidden in the third eye, in the wakeful state of the human physical body. When we meditate at the third eye, we do not directly see our true self, but we are meditating on the true self. Only we have removed one cover from our true self, the cover of our physical being. We are becoming unaware of this cover and opening up ourself in the inner cover. The inner cover is called the astral cover or sensory cover or suksham sharir, fine, fine body, because it has no matter, but it has all the sense perceptions in it. It can see, touch, taste, smell. Everything is the same as we have here, more sharp. So that is also a cover, but we are moving towards our true self. If we do the same thing again, the third eye of the inner self, then we can become unaware of the sense perceptions and we reach further close to our true self. And that is the causal self. Causal self is nothing but our true self, the soul, and covered only with the mind which is also like a body upon us. And it's a thinking machine. We are wearing it like a body. And it has no shape. The inner body, the astral body, is like the shape of this body. Sometimes looks a little bigger. But because imagination is active there, we can make it different forms and so on. But the inner body is still a body like this. We still have div divided sense perceptions. In the causal plane, we have just like a feeling that we are like a piece of light or something, like we are a piece of an oblong body, not a regular body, but we are there with something around us. And it's a thinking machine that thoughts are going all around us. And that's the nature of the mind which expresses itself like a body. When we are pulled beyond that, within that body, third eye center of the inner body, we reach our true home, which I reach our true self, our soul. There we discover that we are the one that gave life to the mind, gave life to the senses, gave life to the physical body, and we give life to the dream body. All happening from one source, our soul, which is immortal, was never born, will never die. If we can go further, that is only with a perfect living master who takes us through a great darkness. That's another big block, like the mind is a big block between 
the three worlds of the mind, physical, astral, and causal, it's a big block. Can't cross it, except with the pull of love. When you are pulled by love to the spiritual stage, where you discover you are a soul, you can't cross that to anything. It's the truth. You found your immortality. Therefore, only something... What story shall I tell? I'll repeat the story that they have been written in the books. The story is that so dark there, between our true home and our discovery of our soul, is so dark that even if you enter the darkness with the maximum light which your soul at that time has of 16 physical suns put together, even at that light you can't pierce that darkness. It's so dark, you can't go. So millions of lights, millions of suns of light is needed which only a perfect living master provides to you to cross the darkness. The other big problem with the darkness is it is not a steady darkness, it's just a story, but it's not a steady darkness, but revolving. Bhavar Gufa is a Bhavar Gufa. It's like a cave that's revolving. Bhavar Gufa. And you have to cross through that only with the help of one with that much bigger light than you can. Therefore, even after achieving immortality and achieving what you truth about your own self, to go to totality, to discover the whole secret of creation, to discover where souls came from, why souls came from, why we became souls, why could we stay in totality? All those answers come from there. In the simple language, it will be totality is love, but not lover, not beloved. Totality is love. Soul makes it lover and beloved. Totality is in a way a concept, love. Souls make it an experience, an application. A love becomes an application at the level of the soul. It becomes an experience of what it actually is. What actually it is becomes an experience. Where are the souls? Within that love, not outside. They never left that. But the experience of division is merely made for making something that exists into an experience. That's the best way I can explain at this time. But going to third eye center right from here is the right direction, even to the ultimate self. Many sources seem to say that one <clears throat> can have only one true master. Is it possible to be picked up by more than one PLM in one lifetime? to be on the list of more than one perfect living master. Maybe behind the scenes, they are working together. <laughs> Many sources seem to say that one can have only one true master. Is it possible to be picked up by more than one PLM in one lifetime? to be on the list of more than one perfect living master. Maybe behind the scenes they are working together. I don't know these sources. Which, <laughs> as I said earlier, one can go through several masters. One is ready for a one master, you find that master. Supposing you're ready for a perfect living master, a perfect living master will come into your life, one master. No change. When a perfect living master comes into your life, you don't need a change. Unless you are not ready perfectly and have to die before you are achieving anything. In the physical body, it's very short life. Then, next life will be another master. Also perfect living master. The last master after which you never come back to the physical world is your last perfect living master and the one master. Before that, there can be many. Can it happen within the same lifetime? It can. Supposing you are initiated by a master and you made no progress during that time. The master was perfect, but you did not perfectly follow what the master was saying, to take it easy, or he'll find out. And your still ideas of going within is limited to astral plane. You can find another master in the same lifetime. It does not mean the first.
to wait for a physical appearance of a master, which you think has been ingrained in your mind. You have to have a living master who is alive at the time when you can make progress. You will get another master who will take you further up. But unless you have crossed a certain stage or a perfect living master has given you a nudge beyond the normal nudge and placed you in a list called A, you have to be born again. You are not as perfect as the final one. But sometimes you can meet perfect masters also, one after the other. And th this happens because masters die. We think we had a connection with the physical form of the master. We are confined to that. And we can't find that same joy, the same pull anywhere. Then a perfect living master will appear in your life to give you the feeling of the same pull, which you missed out. So there are many factors that govern how many masters come into your life. I don't mind sharing once again with you the story of my friend Tirlok Chand, an engineer from Burma, who was very keen to find a perfect master. He had met many yogis, swamis, many masters in Burma where he was working. And then he heard in India, in Madras, there's a swami who can, with his power and with his mantra, he can give you instant, immediate knowledge of the true home. He was a very cautious person with money. I'm using the word cautious, don't want to say very miserly. <laughs> because at that time, the currency in Burma was a rupee, the same currency in India. And he would take out a one rupee bill, say, to spend or not to spend? Not to spend, back in the pocket. With this habit of his, he was able to accumulate and save 30,000 rupees. In a short uh, life of an engineer with a small salary, which was a big amount at that time. So he decided to go to that Swami in Madras who could give instant knowledge. And he sold everything, wound up, got his 30,000 rupees and came to Madras, a city called now Chennai. And in Madras, he met the Swami and he said, Swamiji, I've heard that you can give some mantra your teaching, can give us true Knowledge. He said, yes, I can. But have you heard the story of King Janak? He said, I have heard. Have you all heard the story of King Janak? If anybody not heard the story of King Janak, okay, I'll tell it again. So, <laughs> just an excuse to tell the story again. I didn't even count the hands. Okay, the story of King Janak is that there was a king in India named Janak who was also a great seeker. And he wanted to find the truth, true knowledge. And he told his ministers and advisors, where can I find true knowledge? And they said, King Janak, you are born in a great country. There's so many swamis, yogis, masters. This country full of them. Just have a big feast. What they called a yag. Have a big yag or a big feast. And they will all come. And you can then Ask them questions, they will give you true knowledge. So the king held a big feast. And hundreds of yogis, swamis, some in saffron colored robes, some in white robes, some in blue robes, some in no robes. They all came. <laughs> and he had many tents assembled in his compound. And they all settled down. The king disguised himself incognito, became a tourist that he should just move amongst them, not, they should not know he's a king. And as he moved amongst them, he tried to listen to what they were talking to each other. And he was surprised at their arrogance and pride, each one saying, I know more than the other. The same text, the same scripture in their hands, and they're arguing, if this doesn't mean that, this doesn't mean that. He said, these people may be learned. They have all the learning, they memorized books. They have no true knowledge. That's not what I wanted. Very disappointed, he came back to the palace and he told his ministers and advisors, I was very disappointed. These people are learned people. They have read books. They remembered the books by heart. They have no true knowledge. I want true knowledge. 
and the advisors and ministers said, King Janak, this is a big country. You only called a few people. Have a beat of drum and have a seven-day feast. Then many more will come and give you true knowledge. So the king organized a seven-day feast and a larger crowd came and he, you know, incognito moved among, among them. It was just a seven-day repeat of the same experience. All learned people repeating the shirokas, repeating the scriptures by heart and not knowing what they mean, having no real true knowledge. They're very disappointed. So he told the ministers and advisors, this is not what I expected. This is not true knowledge. I want true knowledge, real knowledge, not learning, not books. They said, Master, uh, King Janak, for that you have to go to a perfect living master and he won't come to these functions of yours. He said, where is he? He said, there's one living on the bank of the river in little hut and his name is Ashta Bakar. Ashta Bakar. Ashta means eight. Ashta Bakar. Bakar means curves. He was a hunchback with curves on his back and his body is deformed. His eyes are sharp and his intellect and his spiritual knowledge is great, vast. You should go and call him. So King Janak went to Ashtabakar in his little hut and Ashtabakar got up. Majesty, what, what have you come here for? What, have, what can I do? He said, I have not come as a king. I have come as a beggar. I want true knowledge. Will you come to my palace and share true knowledge with me? Ashtabakar said, you've taken all the trouble to come to me. I will certainly come to your palace. So a date was fixed and the king in his auditorium in the palace invited all the nobles, all the neighboring kings, neighboring princes and princesses and the whole hall was full of nobility and royalty. Ashtabakar came with about seven or eight of his disciples and as they entered the auditorium, they took off their shoes, which was the custom. And they walked up barefoot to the stage where the king had placed two chairs, one for himself and one for the master. He invited the master to sit on the chair. As Ashtabakar was walking toward the stage, he heard people murmuring something. And they looked at the hunchback. They were saying, what a kind of man is invited. Look at his body. He's going to give us knowledge. If he can't even take care of his body, what knowledge can he have? And they were making comments like that which Ashtabakar heard on the way to the stage. When he sat on the chair, he said, King Janak, what is the price of leather today? King Janak said, Master, I don't understand the question. We came, we brought you here to tell us true knowledge. What has leather to do with it? He said, are these not all leather merchants sitting here? He says, no, 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 they are nobility, royalty sitting here. He said, the way they looked at my skin and my body, I thought they may be dealing in skin. So people saw there's a sense of humor in the man. Then they began to listen to him. Then Ashtabakar said, what kind of knowledge do you want? King Janak said, instant knowledge. By the way, that makes me feel King Janak was an American in his past life. <laughs> instant coffee, instant knowledge. Ashtabakar said, there's a price to pay for instant knowledge. He said, anything you want, all my coffers, all my wealth is open. Just ask your price, it will be given to you. He said, I want three things. King Janak said, you can have 10, 20, whatever you want. I only want three things. Give me your body. Give me your wealth. Give me your mind. I'll give you instant knowledge. It's a strange price tag. But... King Janak was such a seeker, he agreed. He said, yes, master, my body is yours. All my wealth is yours. My mind is also yours. Give me knowledge. Ashtabhaka said, are you sure you've given these to me? Yes, master, I'm sure I've given them. Okay, if the body is mine, I can place it wherever I like. Pick up this body and place it on the shoes I left at the entrance to your auditorium. King Jana got up. This is not my body. I gave it to him. I have to place it wherever he says. And he walked toward the shoes. All these people again began to murmur, what kind of knowledge are you listening to? Telling the king to sit on the shoes is his real knowledge coming up? What kind of man has he invited? Now, as these murmurs were going on, 
king heard them he said they don't know they think i am a king with so much wealth and so on and i am sitting on the shoes as this thought came to him ashtabakar shouted from the stage king you have no business to think of that wealth you given it to me he said oh my god i forgot this wealth is no longer mine now i can't even think of that wealth as mine as this thought was going on ashtabakar shouted you can't even think about the wealth because you given your mind to me say can't even think got his head like this can't even think and he got instant awareness inside ashtabakar said need not go and sit on the shoes come back so he came back to the stage he said did you get instant knowledge yes master i did any doubt no doubt this was clear any questions no question he said now this was just a sampling what exists inside now do meditation i'll tell you how to do meditation regularly and according to your destiny in 20 years you will get this knowledge once again this <laughs> is a slow process <laughs> this was just a sample that is how king janak got his true knowledge so the swami now tells i'm going back to the story of the swami and the lokjan swami says i follow the teachings of king janak and ashtabakar you want true knowledge give me three things give me your body give me your wealth and give me your mind i'll give you true knowledge and the lokjan said yes master it's yours or let's start with wealth first how much do you have i have 30000 rupees transfer them to my account tomorrow i have to start building a temple this man who was thinking one rupee to transfer or not to spend or not transferred 30000 rupees to the swami's account then he said now you have to do you given your wealth to me now you have to give your body to give your body you have to make a sacrifice the sacrifice is that the meditation technique i will teach you involves your body it requires breathing exercise as you have to breathe one breath from the left nostril one breath from the right nostril and you cannot use your fingers because fingers are outside they'll draw your attention outside the process is inside therefore it has to be done with your tongue which is inside the tongue has to be reversed back so from the tongue inside you have to make the choice left or right left or right and since the tongue cannot move back because of the tendons here i have to cut those tendons off he said my master made me cut my tendons off took out his tongue like a snake long snake my like tongue he said this is a way the tongue will go back and he said since it is a sacrifice i won't make it but an easy way of cutting the tendons i'll do it by scraping them slowly over a month <laughs> the lokchand went under the torture for a month and got the tongue released and he became take his tongue out like the swami could do and he learned how to put the tongue backwards and breathe to the pranayam the breathing exercises alternately from one nostril to another and he had some experiences of seeing then he said give me the mind and he taught him some mantras and he got some experiences lights coming up white light red light blue light and he could see something some faces past life faces something but not what he wanted he said swami ji i have not got what i wanted i want true knowledge not these little experiences he said my child this is all i can give you this is all i learned from my master if you want more than that you have to wait for another master the lokchand waited eventually he found this master great master baba sawan singh who initiated him and he made rapid progress his seeking was very strong and he was so full of love and devotion he could see great master in everybody he met it is a wonderful experience as a friend of mine i learned so much from him from this telokshan one day we were all sitting next to great master in the evening smaller group and the lokchand was there i was there my dad was there i remember five or six people were there with great master and the lokchand says master had i known 
you are the perfect true master for me. I would not have given that 30,000 rupees to the Swami. <laughs> the great master smiled and he said, the Lokchand, you don't know. When you came to me, I transferred those 30,000 to my account. <laughs> and then he explained to us waiting here. No time with any master is lost when you are seeking the truth. You can meet any number of masters on your way. They all help you move forward up to a point. And when that point is such, you're not satisfied. You can't go further with that master. Another master will come into your life. Eventually, if nothing has help, helped you, a perfect living master will come into your life. And that is why when a perfect living master finds you, he does not say, you went to a wrong master. You went to a lesser master. He'll say, you went to the right masters. All of them were right for you. Because that's how your spiritual journey was designed. That you had to go through those processes and then come to the perfect living master. So that is why it's not unusual for a perfect living master to appear after many masters. And they may, the earlier masters may be perfect also and you may not be perfect yourself in readiness. So that can happen. I do not know the screen behind which they all work secretly. <laughs> but one thing I can say, that perfect living masters are constantly aware of the same state of consciousness, which is one. Therefore, in that sense, you might say, the power which is making them perfect in this physical body is the same power. So sometimes they call it the master power, happen to be the same. You're all perfect living masters. That is true. You one more question? <clears throat> My dearest adorable master, why do I love you so much? It's really sad to go away after every event, but I still can't see you in my meditation always. Why do I love you so much? I don't know. <laughs> but your saying so makes me love you. I have that weakness. If you love me, I automatically fall in love with you. The big weakness I have. That I can very easily love you. If you love me little, I love you more. It is really sad to go away after every event, but still can't see you in my meditation always. I also feel sad that I have such a good time with you, especially on a Bandara in India. Uh, during the Bandara of Great Master's Master, which used to take place on the 29th of December each year. That's the day Baba Jamal Singh passed away. During those bandaras, it was a celebration. And since most celebrations in India meant eating more, more food was prepared. In the common kitchen there, which we call the langar, the very simple food was served, the chapatis, the bread, flat bread, and one vegetable cooked like a curry, and one dal, lentil cooked. Standard meal on all the meals that we used to have in the Dera Langar. But on Bandara Day, some two vegetables extra and a halwa or a sweet made it very delicious. More food. So many of us remembered Bandara for the food also. <laughs> but we remembered the master. Why it is so significant that day, 29th December, for me was because I spent so much time with Great Master on 29th December in his house. There was a small little room which was the original hut in which Baba Jamal Singh sat and meditated and gave his discourses from. He had built the one small room around that and the rest of the house was built around that. On that day, he would go open that little place. And twice it happened that he took me along with him. 
and when I went with him into the little room, 29 December, I saw tears in my master's eyes I'd never seen before. Tears of love, tears of a devotion, tears of a relationship I haven't seen in the world. And since I saw them, I had the same tears with him. I can never forget that. Because of that one unique incident, I've never been able to forget the Bandara of Baba Jabal Singh on 29th December. Though I don't celebrate it like we celebrate my master's Bandara, privately I celebrate it. And that's the day when tears come back to me, same tears I saw in great master's eyes. It was a very big event for me. That is why that Bandara meant so much for me. But it was a very important event for most people. I remember I had a great grandmother alive at that time. My father, grandfather, grandfather's mother alive. She was very sick. And my father and grandfather decided it'll be a great idea to get her the darshan of great master before she passes away. And if he had darshan, she'll get initiated in the next life. That was our belief. So we carried her. And we requested Great Master on that Bandara day, 29th December. Can we place this great grandmother next to you because she is hard of hearing? So she can hear your discourse. And he said, certainly. So we put that lady, old lady, next to Great Master on the stage. So she could hear very well. And she heard the whole satsang discourse very peacefully with a smile on her face. It ended, we brought her back home. We said, did you enjoy the satsang, the discourse? Well, very much. We said, what did the master say? Now, in those days when master would end his discourse, he would say that people who have to go and use toilets, there are no toilets here. You have to go toward the riverside. The ladies go on the left side of the river. And the women go on the right side. They separated the areas by using an open toilet in the, on the sand, on the beaches of the river. So we asked her, what did the master say in his satsang? She said, ladies go on the left side. <laughs> That's all she remembered. But we are still happy. And even this little incident is still in my mind and in my memory. That how when we go to a discourse, we only listen what we listen with our capability of listening at that time. We never listen to the whole thing. We listen, next time we listen, we listen more, even if there's a repetition. Some people have complained to me. You repeat the same stories every time. Don't you have anything new to tell? I said, it's a sign of old age. If you want to know somebody's old, you go and he'll be telling the same thing over and over again. And because of his age, people will have the courtesy to not tell him that you're telling the same story. <laughs> Just a courtesy. So at my age, it's normal for me to repeat the same stories. But somebody had said the same thing to great master. Master, we have heard your discourses, heard 100 of your discourses, more or less you say the same thing. And master said, are you meditating regularly? Not yet. You need 101 more. <laughs> That's the point here, that we only don't hear all of it. I'm very happy to answer these few questions and add my own comments to it. Thank you very much for joining me, and I'll see you at 3 o'clock again.